There once was a king in India, and for his birthday, a decree went out that all the chiefs should bring gifts fit for a king. Some brought fine silks, some brought fancy swords, some brought gold. At the end of the line came walking a very wrinkled little old man who had walked many days' journey from his village down by the sea. And as he walked up, the king's son said, what gift do you bring for the king? And the old man slowly opened his hand to reveal a very beautiful seashell with swirls of purple and yellow, red and blue. And there it is. And the king's son said, that's no gift for a king. What kind of gift is that? And the old man looked up at him slowly and said, long walk, part of gift. <laughs> In a few moments, I'm going to bring you a simple gift, a little gift that I believe is a gift worth spreading. But before I do, let me take you on my long walk. Like most of you, I started life as a little kid. How many of you started life as a little kid? <laughs> oh, about half of you, okay. <laughs> the rest of you, what, were you born full grown? <laughs> Talk about impossible. As a little kid, I had a fascination with things that were impossible. I always wanted to do the impossible. Well, today is a day I've been looking forward to for many years because today is a day I'm going to attempt to do the impossible right here, right before you, right before your very eyes, right here at TEDx Huntsville. I'm going to start by revealing the ending. I'm going to prove to you that the impossible is not impossible. And I'm going to end by giving you a gift worth spreading. But before I do, let me take on my long walk. In my quest to do the impossible, I found there are two things that are universal among people all around the world. Everybody has, it's like a double-edged sword. Everyone has fears and everyone has dreams. In my quest to do the impossible, I found there are three reasons why I do the impossible today. Dodgeball, Superman, and Mosquito. There, now you know why I do the impossible today. So now let me take you on my long walk, my journey. My journey from fears to dreams, from words to swords, from dodgeball to Superman to mosquito, from fearing what's possible to actually doing the impossible. On October 4th, 2007, my heart was racing, my knees were shaking as I stepped out on stage at Sanders Theater and, and at Harvard University to accept the 2007 Ig Nobel Prize in Medicine for a little medical research paper I co-wrote called Sword Swallowing and Its Side Effects. <laughs> it was published in a little, little magazine I'd never read before, something known as the British Medical Journal. And um, it was an incredible, incredible uh, honor I will never forget, an impossible dream come true, an unexpected surprise I will never ever forget. But it was not the most memorable part of my life. October 4th, 1967, this scared, shy, skinny, wimpy kid stepped up in front of his class. His heart was racing, his knees were shaking as he got ready to speak. He opened his mouth. And the words would not come. He stood paralyzed in panic, trembling in tears, sick to his stomach, frozen in fear. This Scared, shy, skinny, wimpy kid suffered from extreme fears. He had fear of the dark, fear of heights, fear of spiders and snakes. Any of you afraid of spiders and snakes? Yeah. He had a fear of water and sharks. Anybody? He had a fear of doctors and nurses and dentists and needles and drills and sharp objects. But more than anything, he had a fear of people. He suffered from low self-esteem, inferiority complex, fear of failure and rejection, and something we didn't even know you could sign up for back then social anxiety disorder. That scared, shy, skinny, wimpy kid was me. Because I had fears, they would tease me and beat me up. They used to laugh and call me names, never let me play in any of their reindeer games. <laughs> there was one game they used to let me play in, dodgeball. And I was not a good dodger. The bullies would call me names, and I would look up, and I'd see these pink dodgeballs hurtling at my face at supersonic speeds. Bam! 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 And I remember walking home from school many days. My face was red and stinging. My ears were red and ringing. My eyes were burning with tears, and their words were burning in my ears. And whoever said sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me, it's a lie. 
Words can cut like a knife. Words can pierce like a sword. Words can make wounds that are so deep they can't be seen. So I had fears, and words were my worst enemy. But I also had dreams. I'd go home, and I would escape to Superman comics. And I dreamed I wanted to be a superhero like Superman. I wanted to um, fight for truth and justice. I wanted to fight against uh, uh, villains and kryptonite. I wanted to fly around the world doing superhuman feats and saving lives. I also had a fascination with things that were real. I would read Guinness Book of World Records and Ripley's Believe It or Not book. Any of you read any of those? Yep. And I saw real people doing real feats. And I thought, if those bullies won't let me play in any of their sports games, I want to do real magic. I want to do real feats. I want to do real things that the bullies cannot do. I want to do something really remarkable with my life. I want to find my purpose and calling. I want to know my life has meaning. I want to do something remarkable with my life and change the world. I want to prove the impossible is not impossible. Fast forward 10 years. It was the week before my 21st birthday. Two things happened in one day that would change my life forever. I was living in, as a missionary in Tamil Nadu, South India, and my mentor, uh, a wise man, said, do you have thromes, Daniel? And I said, thromes? What are thromes? He said, thromes are major life goals, like a cross between dreams and goals, like a bucket list. If you could go any place you wanted to go, do anything you wanted to do, be anyone you wanted to be, where would you go, what would you do, who would you be? I said, oh man, I can't do that, I'm too scared, I've got too many fears. That night, I took my little rice mat up on the roof of the, the bungalow, Thiruvannamalai, in Tamil Nadu, and I stretched out underneath the stars to watch the bats dive bombing for mosquitoes. And all I could think about was thrones and dreams and goals and those bullies with the dodgeballs. A few hours later, I woke up. My heart was racing. My knees were shaking. But this time, it was not with fear. My entire body was convulsing. And for the next five days, I was on my deathbed, fighting for my life, my body convulsing, my going in and out of consciousness, my brain burning up with 105 degree malaria fever. And the whole time, whenever I was conscious, when I'd come out of my weird dreams, all I could think about were thrones and what I wanted to do with my life. Finally, on the night before my 21st birthday, I, in a moment of clarity, I came to a realization. I realized that that little mosquito, Anopheles stevens eye, that little mosquito that weighed less than five micrograms, less than a grain of salt, if that mosquito could take out a 170 pound man, I realized that was my kryptonite. Then I realized, no, 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 it's even smaller than that. It's not the mosquito, it's that little parasite inside the mosquito, Plasmodium falciparum, that kills over a million people a year and infects 200 million people a year. Then I realized, no, 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 it's even smaller than that. But to me, it seems so much greater. I realized that fear was my kryptonite, my parasite, that crippled and paralyzed me my entire life. And you know, there's a big difference between danger and fear. Danger is real. Fear is a choice. I realized I had a choice. I could either live in fear and die in failure that night, or I could face my fears and reach for my dreams and dare to live. And you know, there's something about being on your deathbed that really makes you appreciate life and learn to, to appreciate life. You know, it's in dying that we live. When you learn to die, you really learn to live. You know, everyone dies. Not everyone really lives. So I decided that night I wanted to live. So I chose a different story for my life. I prayed a little prayer that night and I said, God, if you let me live till my 21st birthday, I will not let fear rule my life any longer. I'm gonna put my fears to death. I'm gonna change my attitude. I'm gonna take on risks and challenges. I'm gonna reach for my dreams. I wanna do something incredible with my life. I wanna find my purpose and calling, make a, a difference in the world. I wanna prove the impossible is not impossible. Now, I won't tell you if I survived until my 21st birthday or not. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. <laughs> but that night, I made my list of my first 10 thrones. I decided I, I, decided I wanted to uh, just shoot for a whole bunch of really crazy things. So I decided I wanted to visit the seven wonders of the world, visit all the major continents of the world, learn a bunch of languages, uh, live on a ship in the ocean, live on a deserted island, live with a tribe of Indians in the Amazon, work with the circus, work in the music business in Nashville and write hit songs. I wanted to climb to the top of the highest mountain in Sweden. I wanted to see Mount Everest at sunrise. I wanted to jump out of an airplane. And over the next 20 years, I accomplished most of those thrones. Um, and every time I'd check one off my list, 
I would add five or 10 more to my list, and my list continued to grow, as did my confidence. For the next seven years, I lived on a little deserted island in the Bahamas, by myself, wearing a loincloth and a thatch uh, hut, spearing sharks and stingrays to eat. Um, that was an incredible time. From there, two years on a cruise ship where I was a scuba instructor, then I moved to Mexico, moved to Pujo Pongo in Ecuador in the Amazon rainforest, where I got to live with a tribe of Indians. Uh, worked in the music business in Nashville for many years, uh, won a national songwriting competition. From there, moved to Stockholm, Sweden, where I worked in the music business, and I climbed to the top of Mount Kebnekaise, the highest mountain in Sweden, high above the Arctic Circle. Last year, I got to see Mount Everest at sunrise. It was awesome. I learned clowning. Uh, this is with Ringling Brothers in Chicago. I'm the one with the uh, red hair. I learned clowning, juggling, unicycle riding, stilt walking, fire eating, glass eating, bed of nails. And in 1997, I heard there were less than a dozen sword swallowers left in the entire world. And I said, I've got to add that to my thrones. That is as close as you can get to doing real magic. So I met a sword swallower. And I asked him for some tips. And he said, I'll give you two tips. Number one, it's extremely dangerous. There are less than a dozen sword swallowers left in the entire world. People have died doing this. Number two, don't try it. <laughs> so I added that to my list of thrones. For the next four years, I practiced 10 to 12 times a day, every day for four years, a total of about 13,000 unsuccessful attempts before I got my first sword down my throat. During that time, I set a throne to become the world's leading expert in sword swallowing. So I searched out every book, magazine, newspaper article, every medical report on sword swallowing. I studied physiology, anatomy. I talked with doctors and nurses, networked all the sword swallowers together into the, world's, into the Sword Swallowers Association International, conducted a two-year medical research survey on sword swallowing that was published in the British Medical Journal, and I learned some fascinating things that I'm going to share with you right now. Things that you've probably never thought of before, but you will tonight when you pick, take your knife and your fork and you start cutting your food and you look at that knife or you see a sword on the wall, you'll remember this. Sword swallowing started about 4,000 years ago in ancient India, right where I'd seen it as a 20-year-old kid. Um, over the past 150 years, sword swallowers have helped make major contributions in the fields of science and medicine, from the development of the rigid endoscope with Dr. Adolf Kussmaul in 1868, to the development of the electrocardiogram in 1906, development of the bronchoscope, fluoroscope, swallowing disorders, digestion, all kinds of different studies have been done on sword swallowers over the past 150 years. Over those 150 years, we know of hundreds of injuries and 29 deaths, including this sword swallower who impaled his heart with his sword in London. We found some really fascinating information. We found that there are from three to eight sword swallowing injuries each year that require hospitalization. I know because I'm the one who gets all the phone calls. I just had a phone call from um, uh, Orlando, Florida, sword swallower there in the hospital, one in Sweden this year, or this, in the past few weeks. But the fascinating thing I learned is how sword swallowers learn to do the impossible. It takes some sword swallower from two years to 10 years to learn to do the impossible, and here's the secret. Don't focus on the 99.9% .9 that's impossible. Focus on that 0.1% that is possible to line everything up and then make it possible. Now let me take you on a little journey into the mind of a sword swallower. In order to swallow a sword, it requires mind over matter meditation, razor sharp concentration, pinpoint accuracy in order to isolate and overcome automatic body reflexes, subconscious reflexes, through, by creating reinforced brain synopsis through repeated muscle memory by deliberate practice of over 10,000 times. Now let me take you on a little journey into the body of a sword swallower. In order to swallow a sword, I have to swallow the blade over my tongue, repress the gag reflex in the cervical esophagus, nav navigate a 90 degree turn down the uh, esophagus, flip open the epiglottis, find the proper alignment into the epiglottis, slide the blade down into the epiglottis, go through the cricopharyngeal upper esophageal sphincter here, repress the peristalsis reflex, the 22 pairs of muscles that swallows your food down into your stomach, uh, from there, I slide the blade into the chest cavity, between the lungs. When I get between the lungs, you can see the heart beat with my sword because I have to actually nudge the heart to the left slightly. If you watch very carefully, you can see the blade beat with the, the sword like that, or beat, beat with the heart. From there, I slide it past through the uh, diaphragm, below the breastbone, um, repress the lower esophageal sphincter, slide the blade all the way down into the stomach, past the liver and kidneys, repress the retroreflex in the stomach all the way down to the duodenum. Piece of cake. If I go further than that, all the way down to my fallopian tubes. <laughs> okay, lady, guys, if you didn't understand that, ask your wives when you get home later. 
People often tell me, they say, it must take a lot of courage in order to risk your life to nudge your heart and swallow a sword. No, what takes real courage is for that scared, shy, skinny, wimpy kid to risk failure and rejection, to bear his heart, swallow his pride, and stand up here in front of a bunch of total strangers and tell you his simple story of his fears and dreams, to risk spilling his guts both literally and figuratively. You see, I've always wanted to do the remarkable with my life, and now I am, but the really remarkable thing is not that I can swallow 21 swords at once, or 20 feet underwater in a tank of sharks and stingrays for Ripley's Believe It or Not, or later for Guinness World Records in Rome, or to swallow a sword heated 1,500 degrees red hot for Stanley's superhumans as a man of steel. Or to swallow a sword for Ripley's Believe It or Not, or Guinness, or to make it on the final of No, that's not the really remarkable thing. The really remarkable thing is that that scared, shy, skinny, wimpy kid who was afraid of heights and water and sharks and doctors and nurses and sharp objects that now God has me swallowing or traveling around the world at heights of 30,000 feet, swallowing sharp objects underwater in tanks of sharks and speaking to doctors and nurses and audiences like you all around the world. You see, I've always wanted to do the impossible with my life, and now I am. I've always wanted to do something really remarkable with my life and change the world, and now I am. I always wanted to be a superhero and fly around the world doing superhuman feats and saving lives, and now I am. And you know, there's still a small part of that little kid's big dream deep inside. Thank you. You know, I've always wanted to find my purpose and calling in life, and now I have. And you know what? It's not what you think. It's not with the swords, my strengths. It's with my weakness, wielding my words. My purpose and calling is to change the world by cutting through fear, one sword at a time, one word at a time, one knife at a time, one life at a time. My purpose is to inspire people to be superheroes in their lives, to do the impossible in their lives. My purpose is to help others find theirs. What's yours? What's your purpose and calling? What were you put here to do? I believe we're all called to be superheroes, to save the world. What is your superpower? Out of a world population of over seven billion people, there are less than a few dozen sword swallers left around the world. But there's only one you. What makes you unique? What is your story? Tell your story, even if your voice is thin and shaky. What are your thrones? If you could go any place you wanted to go, do anything you wanted to do, be anything you wanted to be, where would you go, what would you do, what would you be? Think back when you were a little kid. What were your big dreams as a little kid? I bet this wasn't it, was it? What were your wildest dreams that you thought were so strange and so obscure? Um, I bet this makes your dreams look not so strange after all. What is your sword? Each one of you has a sword, a double-edged sword of fears and dreams. Swallow your sword, ladies and gentlemen. Follow your dreams. It's never too late to be. For all those bullies with the dodgeballs, all those kids who said I'd never be able to do the impossible, I've got just one thing I want to say to you. Thank you. Because without villains, we wouldn't have superheroes. I'm going to attempt to do the impossible right now. This is extremely dangerous. It could kill me. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I'm going to need your help on this. No, no, no. I need your help on the counting part. All of you. Okay? If you know the words, all right? Let's practice. Ready? One, two, three. No, that's two, but you've got the idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Actually, thank you from the bottom of my stomach. I told you I was going to do the impossible, and today I have. But the impossible thing was not swallowing this sword. The impossible thing 
My biggest throne, my biggest dream was for that scared, shy, skinny, wimpy kid to face his fears, to stand up here on a TED stage and to change the world one sword at a time, one word at a time, one life at a time. And if I've made you think in new ways, if I've made you believe the impossible is not impossible, if I've inspired you to do the impossible in your life, then my job is done and yours is just beginning. And here's my gift to you. Never stop dreaming, never stop believing. Thanks for believing in me and thanks for being part of my dream. The impossible is not impossible. And I believe that, ladies and gentlemen, is a gift worth spreading. Long walk, part of gift. Thank you. Thank you.